there. Um, why don't we go ahead and start and I will um, just let people in um, as we go. But um, welcome everybody. This is our um, third uh, lecture uh, in our series on Pirates of the Carolinas. And I'm really excited about this one. We have um, my colleague, Karen Bloom, who's at Historic Charleston Foundation. She's the uh, in charge of the education program. She's a public historian. Um, she has undergraduate and graduate degrees in historic sites archeology, span um, particularly sites of the American Revolution. Her passion over the last 20 years has been sharing the hidden histories of the colonial era with interested audiences through conventional and unconventional methods and programs. She brings diverse narratives to light that have long been ignored. Um, Karen is manager of education and programming for HCF, as I mentioned, and she works a lot, same as we do with K through 12 visitors, and she's planning and executing interpretive programming for people of all ages, so we'll definitely check that out. Um, she also loves using digital uh, and social media, such as YouTube, and she's got a really great um, uh, uh, profile on Instagram if you if you are on Instagram, it's at living underscore her story. Um, and she's got some great posts on there and Facebook and YouTube, as well as TikTok. And she's got um, her email, I'll put in the chat, but it's livingherstorian at gmail.com. Um, and what we're going to talk about tonight is really do have my contact for the end of the presentation, too. Sorry. Would you say I put my I put my contact information at the end of the presentation as well. So oh, perfect. That's great. So we'll have a couple of opportunities to see it. That's wonderful. Um, so yeah, but um, tonight we're we are going to talk about her story. <laughs> we're going to talk about female pirates of um, of many eras um, and geographic areas. So. Um, I know she's got a really exciting presentation for y'all, so I'll let her go. I will add, though, before I turn it over to Karen, that she's going to join us Saturday. We had a really great time this past Saturday with the crew of the Charles Revenge, um, and I'm going to post more pictures from Saturday on our Facebook account, but we had a blast, and they were so much fun explaining about medicines of the time period and um, knots and all sorts of really great stuff um, and generally kind of learning about pirates. Um, we had old and young and everybody in between and they all had a blast. So Karen and her husband Andrew are going to be here doing kind of the same thing this Saturday, Living History. And Karen's going to portray Mary Reed, who you may have heard about, who's a a pirate, a female pirate, and she rode or <laughs> sailed with Calico Jack Rackham, who Andrew is going to portray. So come by uh, the Powder Magazine on Saturday from 10 to 3. Bring the kids, bring the family. Um, it should be a lot of fun, um, and it's free with regular museum admission. So we hope to see you. Um, and like I said, we'll have questions at the end, but I'm just going to turn it over to Karen. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Catherine. I am so excited to be here and talk to you all about um, Roguish Women. Uh, the title of this presentation is Piratically, Feloniously, and in a Nostal Manner, um, which is a quote from the trial of Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. So, Rogue Women on the High Seas. So, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And yeah, all right. Is that working for everybody, hopefully? Great. All right, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with this platform, let me start by introducing you to Prezi. This is a slightly different version of presentation software. It is not PowerPoint slides, so it doesn't go linearly. You can see that we have a map of the world here, and we're going to be flying around the world learning about women pirates all over the place. So. Um, I will do my best not to make you seasick, and um, we will go from here. I did, in fact, borrow that line 
from the trials of Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, they stood accused as having piratically, feloniously, and in an hostile manner set upon, board, and enter a certain merchant sloop called the Mary, and then and there did make an assault in and upon the said Thomas Dillon, who was master of the Mary, and then and there piratically and feloniously, they really like that phrase, did steal, take, and carry away the said sloop Mary and the apparel and takel of the same sloop of the value of 300 pounds of current money of Jamaica. Um, that's just one brief piece of a paragraph out of the charges that were brought in court against Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed. And they're so often repeated that you can't mistake the criminal nature of the endeavors of those two women. But women pirates are shrouded in myth and legend, heroic to some, villainous to others, and sometimes they're cast in the role of anti-hero, outside the law, but perhaps not outside of justice. Seafaring robins of the hood, maybe, except instead of stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, stealing from the rich and taking for themselves. Um, today, we're going to look at a number of women who fall into the broad category of pirate, but we're not only going to learn about who they were and what they did, but maybe the ethos surrounding each type of woman, and then you can decide for yourself whether she was really a pirate or not. And we're going to start not in Europe. But rather um, in Mediterranean. So first we're going to go to the Corsairs who ruled the Mediterranean, the Barbary Coast Pirates as they were known, and they were well known and feared and respected in their times, and they're remembered pretty dramatically today, just like pirates in Europe of the Golden Age, and one in particular uh, was this lady here. Now, this is a modern rendition of her image, um, and I got it from Wikimedia Commons there, so you can see her yourself. When we think of the golden age of piracy, we're talking about the late 17th and early 18th centuries, and the conversation is decidedly centered on Europe. But across time and across, across the globe, people have been engaging in unlawful maritime activity. There are sparse records of female pirates from the ancient world, but they do exist, as well as what are now the British Isles, but in ancient times before they were conquered by the Roman descended Britons. Uh, indeed, for as long as people have been plying the Mediterranean to promote trade between Europe and Southwest Asia and North Africa, there have been people plundering those trade routes. And this lady here is Lala Aisha bint Ali ibn, Rashid al Alami. And she was born actually in southern Spain, sometime between 1485 and 1495, the daughter of a wealthy family of nobles who fled when Ferdinand and Isabella came to power in Spain. Um, al Alami's family settled in Morocco, even though they were part originally of the Muslim kingdom of Granada, which was where Andalusia is today. Um, she was a highly privileged, highly educated and multilingual woman. And as a member of a family of the Muslim ruling class, she actually had a reason to remember the fall of the Muslim kingdom of Granada at the hands of Spanish Catholics. She ended up marrying a much older man. He was about 30 years her senior. His name was Abu Hassan Ali, and he was the governor of a major Moroccan port called Tetuan. And he was a military man in his own right. He often led campaigns against the Portuguese, which left Aisha to govern the city. When Mandari died sometime between 1515 and 1519, she ended up becoming governor, not just acting political leader, but governor herself with the consent of the citizens of Tetuan. Eventually, she became known by her noble title, Saida Alhura, which essentially means noble woman who is free and independent, a woman who doesn't answer to any other authority than herself. She had privateers at her command as a member of the ruling class, 
and she had a bone to pick with her Catholic enemy. So she found herself at the head of a powerful maritime juggernaut. And then she thought it would be a great idea to join forces with a famed corsair, Oruk Reyes, who is known to us as Barbarossa. Redbeard, one of the most famous pirates in the Mediterranean. Uh, their rule together of the waters in the Mediterranean was nearly complete. Not only did her ships raid foreign vessels, they attacked towns all around the Mediterranean and they absolutely took captives. But the question is whether that makes her a pirate or just a political leader of a different nation. Um, so was she a pirate queen or was she just a queen, just a governor? That I think depends on your perspective. Um, if we're looking from sort of that European centric viewpoint, then perhaps she's a pirate. She's raiding other ships and towns and taking captives. Um, but she um, really had some influence and some sway, legitimate political sway. In 1541, she remarried and she married the Sultan of Morocco. So now we're not just talking about a governor of a little town, we're talking about the Sultan of Morocco. And for generations and generations, the marriage of the Sultan of Morocco only ever happened in the capital city of Fez. Well, not when Aisha married him. When Saida al Hassan, um, sorry, al. Um, Oh man, I lost my place. <laughs> this is why I usually just talk off the cuff. When Saida al Hura married the Sultan of Morocco, she actually insisted that it be done in her hometown, in Tetoukan, which is what they did. Um, the Sultan traveled from Fez to Tetouan and, you know, accepted the marriage in her place instead of his. Now they did eventually go to Fez and she spent her time there. Um, she was a politician, she was a ruler and a sovereign, but just like all empires, the power of her empire waned in her older years. She didn't wanna give up power, but she was essentially peacefully deposed by her son-in-law, Moulay Ahmed al-Hassan al-Mandari. So um, a man who married the daughter of her first husband, eventually took power from her in Tetuan. Um, and she ended up retiring peacefully to a nearby town and lived out her days another 20 years. So when she died in 1561, she was somewhere between the ages of 66 and 76, a very successful commander of a fleet, a very successful politician and governor and sultaness. Um, and so I just leave it to you to decide whether she really deserves the title of pirate. That's how um, Saida al Hura has been remembered by the Western world, um, but not so much by other regions of the country. The Swana region has a very different legacy for her. Moving a little bit earlier in time and coming back into focus in Europe, both on the continent and then on the Isles. First, we visit the 14th century and Jeanne de Bellevue, a French noblewoman who, after her marriage to her third husband, Olivier IV de Clisson, became Jeanne de Clisson. And later in her career, she became known as the Lioness of Brittany. So you can see there, Jeanne is on the left and she is holding the shield with the lion on it. That's the shield of Brittany. And she's even pictured on the seaside with a ship behind her. So you might be able to see where this is going. Um, when she married Olivier, because of their combined titles and lands, the de Clisson family would have been considered senior nobles in the Duchy of Brittany. In the 14th century, Brittany is a separate country from France, even though it's contained in what is modern France today. And the de Clissons lived on the southeast border of the duchy. So they were on the, um, on the property border with France. And when the War of Breton succession touched their lives in 1342, Olivier fought with France. He was stationed in the town of Vannes 
And when he was helping defend it, it fell to the British. He ended up being captured and released in a prisoner exchange. Um, so things should have been looking up, right? They're very wealthy people. They have um, concluded the war of Breton succession. Uh, an agreement has been met and things should be looking up. So Olivier went to Paris. He went for a celebratory tournament because in the Middle Ages, how do we celebrate the end of the war? We hold a big tournament with knights and jousting and all the things, see a knight's tale. Um, no, I'm kidding, that's not historically accurate. All right, that's my favorite fun movie about that time period. Um, all right, so unfortunately, when he got to Paris, Olivier was arrested by French soldiers and he was incarcerated there. He faced a sham trial. He was convicted of treason for conspiring with the English to enable the downfall of the town that he was trying to defend. And he was subsequently beheaded. So Jeanne, uh, Jeanne did not take this very well. She was understandably upset, especially when they not only beheaded Olivier, but they put his head on a pike, desecrated his body and hung it from the walls of the city. Um, so this is the part where we get to outside the law, but perhaps not outside of justice. Um, Jeanne vowed revenge and she raised a gang. First, it was a gang of um, street soldiers, land soldiers, and they started raiding castles and towns along the border with France. Eventually, she turned to the sea. And in order to do that, she sold her property. So this combined a state of real property and objects, castles, and things to fill them, she started selling off all of it, land, places, pieces, all of it, so that she could raise a fleet, um, which she did. She bought an entire fleet of ships, she painted their hulls black, and they flew red sails, and they were known as the Black Fleet. These ships were a treacherous and terrifying encounter for any French vessel that might cross her path. By all accounts, she was ruthless. Uh, Jeanne and her Black Fleet plied the Bay of Biscay and the English Channel and raided and murdered all the way as they went and Jeanne on her flagship called My Revenge. So she really had her vision of what she was wanting to do. There wasn't really any um, objective other than avenging her husband's wrongful death. She apparently had a habit of leaving one crew member alive from every ship that she attacked that that man might go and tell the, torts, tell the story and spread the legend of the lioness of Brittany. Um, and I wonder if that's not where Hollywood movies get it today. Wouldn't that be interesting from, from the legacy of a female pirate instead of one of these, you know, pirates of the Caribbean, these men that we keep hearing about? Um, anyway, she sailed for 13 years. Eventually she ended up marrying an English nobleman because she was super over France. And she died just three years later in 1359 at about the age of 59. But she made no bones about her objectives when she went to sea. Some 200 years later, a daughter of Gaelic Ireland took to the seas during the age of Elizabethan exploration and conquest. So who do we hear about most during this time period? Sir Francis Drake. Um, no, 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 same slide. <laughs> um, so as the daughter of a chieftain, Granya Niwala, which is my best attempt at pronouncing her name in Gaelic, and somehow we get Grace O'Malley from that, uh, likely enjoyed um, some privilege in education herself. She was also uh, a noble, noble woman in her community. According to Gaelic custom, she could own property and she retained that right even through marriage. The Owaya clan ruled over parts of County Mayo and Clue Bay, which is in the northwest of Ireland, um, as well as over several of the small islands that sit in the bay and just outside of it. Her story is much the same as other highborn women through the ages who had the opportunity uh, to book conventional social norms and roles. So again, so far we've been talking about highborn women, people who have the opportunity 
to do something different than their conventional roles would dictate. Eventually, her um, pirating of the bays and the islands around her native land, with a special focus on preying on English victims, caught the notice of none other than Queen Elizabeth I herself. She was another pioneering man, a woman in a man's work and world, of course. And having married twice and given birth to several children, Grania uh, retained her autonomy and political influence in her own local sphere, even as Elizabeth tried to push for westward expansion of the British Empire. So that was, of course, to the discontent of the local Gaelic clans and families. Eventually, uh, Owaya's youngest son and her half-brother were both arrested for conspiracy against England as Elizabeth's deputies charged ever westward across Ireland. Grania petitioned Elizabeth to release her family members um, to the point where she actually went to see Queen Elizabeth. And that's what you see in the second image there on that slide on the right. That is supposed to be Grace O'Malley petitioning Queen Elizabeth for the release of her son and her brother-in-law um, and to allow the Owaya clan to live in peace. In September of 1593, Elizabeth granted that petition. Um, and though a lot of lore surrounds their meetings, a general sense of mutual respect between these two powerful women persists. Um, some of the lore that revolves around their meeting includes something like Grace O'Malley refusing to curtsy or bow to Queen Elizabeth because Grace said that she was a queen in her own right. Um, as an academic, I have to tell you that there's no historical evidence for this, but you know, oral tradition is important, so maybe. Um, there is some suggestion that Grania Nihuala died in 1603, the same year as Queen Elizabeth I, um, but Grace's family's lands and properties remained intact and unmolested. So Elizabeth agreed to let them live in peace. Grace agreed to maybe pirate a little less, pray a little bit less on the English. So backing out here to the map of the world, next we are gonna move forward in time and we are going to arrive in China at probably the most successful pirate of all time. Gender doesn't even come into the conversation here. Zheng Yisao, born Sek Yung, commanded an entire fleet. And we've jumped the timeline here. We are clear into the 19th century, but if we go back to the beginning, back to the beginning, beginning of her life in the 18th century, we find Sek Yung, a sex worker in a floating brothel in China, right at the turn of the century. She was kidnapped by pirates, according to legend, at the age of 26. And she later married the captain of the vessel, Tseng Yut. So when she married him, she was no longer um, uh, a person on the margins of society, right? Now she's the captain's wife. Um, she is untouchable. Much like some of her earlier European counterparts, Zheng Yi Sao seemed to willingly embrace the life of piracy. So very much like Jeanne de Cuisson, very much like and Bonnie and Mary Reed, who we'll talk about in a minute. She helped her husband form the Red Flag Gang. And after his drowning death, very unfortunate, in a typhoon, um, she persisted at running a fleet. She found herself at the head of it, and at its largest, it consisted of around 600 ships. 600 ships in the 19th century and 60,000 sailors on those ships. She commanded a floating army. She was renowned for her leadership skills, her tactical knowledge of seafaring warfare, and her ability to command loyalty from 60,000 men, even in the face of some of the strictest rules observed by any pirate alliance in history. She kept those rules on a hard line. 
Among other rules addressing loyalty was honesty, the resolution of conflict between sailors, and Zheng Yixiao made certain that any woman who was captured in the fleet's activity was not abused or mistreated while on board any of their ships. The punishment for doing so was death, and she took a hard line on that. She took her pirates into battle against European powers frequently, especially the Portuguese, and eventually negotiated a peace with the governors of the provinces of South China because she was, um, she was praying in her own waters as well. So the governors of the provinces of South China were so distraught at their activities and so powerless to stop them that they essentially created a peace treaty. They allowed her to retire in peace. They promised her that they wouldn't bring any retribution for her nefarious maritime career. They wouldn't arrest her, they wouldn't prosecute her. Um, and in return, just stop pirating, just disband the fleet, go on shore, don't go to sea anymore, and we won't prosecute you. And so she agreed. Um, she ended up securing herself an official title in the government. She was the mistress of several gambling houses, and brothels, and she ran them for the next three decades. She was the richest woman on earth. Um, and she did it through a pirating career that was so extensive and so untouchable that the only way to get her to stop was for official governments to negotiate, right? Um, which today it's like, well, we don't negotiate with terrorists. Well, they sure did, they had to. It's estimated that Sek Yong, Zheng Yizhao, sometimes um, taking other nicknames as well, died in the 1840s. So friends, that's not that long ago. The 1840s is not yet 200 years past. Uh, she was in her very late 60s and that of course secured her place as the most successful pirate of all time and one who escaped government retribution which is interesting because that's normally the reason why we know the names of people who go a pirating. It's because they got caught. Um, she didn't. She didn't. She created uh, an immense and impossible to ignore legacy. All right. And so off we go to the Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, this is. So we're going to return now to that sort of Eurocentric view and what we view as the golden age of piracy, the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the late 16 and early 1700s. And this is probably going to be the part where I disappoint the most of you. <laughs> um, here we go. We're going to break some hearts. Are you ready? Here we go. All right. Most of what we know about the two most famous female pirates in history comes from a publication that was most likely fiction. And it was written by an anonymous author in 1724, which was about four years after they were arrested for their crimes. So these three bullet points about each of these women are just things that I plucked out of um, both the transcript of their trials and the general history of the pirates, which was written in 1724, to give you some idea of what is likely and what is unlikely. The general history of the pirates was a lot of things. It was a fantastic piece of propaganda in 1724. It was likely a huge moneymaker for its author and for its publisher, especially. We know that because a second edition was issued the very next year. Um, it came out with expansions and specifically those expansions addressed the life stories of Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. The history, this general history of pirates is problematic because the author is unknown. And that means that the veracity of the tales that he tells are in question. Once upon a time, scholars and historians thought that Captain Charles Johnson, the author as listed, was a nom de plume for Daniel Defoe. But that theory is no longer very widely accepted in historical um, academic circles. 
which is kind of a shame if you know it isn't him because Defoe even though he was a fiction writer he was renowned for doing very thorough research he already knew about maritime life he actually personally knew some pirates and may have the suggestion was well he knew these pirates or at least some people like them and he took their stories and embellished them a little bit and then produced this general history of pirates um, but without Defoe's name behind it all of this becomes more suspect and more pro problematic. Defoe's name bears some clout. So the only reliable pieces of this 1724 publications, uh, publication are what the author pulled from the actual transcripts of the trials of these pirates. So the author did do that. He did pull some pieces from the transcripts of the trials where these folks, not just Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed, but all of them were accused. Um, but some of the more detailed pieces are super problematic. Um, pivoting really quick to the published pamphlet, The Trials of Captain John Rackham and Other Pirates. It was printed in 1721, shortly after the convictions and hangings of Rackham and most of his crew. Witness statements describe Anne Bonny and Mary Reed's actions aboard ship, everything from the corroboration of their willingness to engage in piracy, right? To do anything aboard ship from sailing to fighting, to plundering, to murdering. They were identified multiple times as having worn men's clothing, though some, uh, some witnesses who were prisoners aboard a Rackham ship claimed that it was only in moments of pirating, of fighting and raiding, that they wore men's clothes, that at other times during regular shipboard activity, that they wore women's clothes. So there's a little discrepancy there. I don't think it really matters in the end, um, but all of these are the facts that are likely to be true because they're written from eyewitness accounts of the testimonies in court. Also true are the facts of their convictions the act of pleading their bellies. I'm sure you all know by now that when Anne Bonny and Mary Reed were convicted of piracy, the thing that saved them from the noose is that they pled their bellies. They were both pregnant. Um, the trials are very matter of fact in their transcription. It says that they fell upon the court and pled their bellies and the court just said, well, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> And they sent a doctor to examine the women who found that indeed they were both actually pregnant. This prolonged their incarceration. It delayed their hangings. Um, <clears throat> another certainty are the records of both of their deaths. And I am here to tell you that there is fair to good certainty of the records of both of their deaths, not just one. Mary Reed's fate has been known for quite a while, actually. She died of a fever in jail, potentially in childbirth or due to complications from childbirth. She was convicted in December of 1720 and she died in April of 1721, which was around the time that her child should have been born. And Bonnie's fate has been more mysterious until recently. Fantastical tales of her escaping from prison engaging in a whirlwind romance in Carolina, a rise to wealthy planter status like her father was before, children resulting in American descendants have all built up this legacy around her. Um, these scenarios, however unlikely, have of course captured imaginations for generations, and especially in Charleston, right? Because this is where she is said to have come. So that connection is felt strongly, even if the story is more myth than fact, because the centuries old story has grown up here. Uh, recently, there was a YouTube content creator of all people from Ohio who decided to pursue uh, the truth about Anne Bonnie. And he looked into national records from St. Catherine's Parish in Jamaica, the same records that yielded the evidence of Mary Reed's fate and burial. Um, through the magic of the internet and extensive family search online database, which is maintained by the Church of Latter-day Saints, this YouTuber discovered a burial record for Anne Bonny in the same St. Catherine's Parish in Jamaica in 1733. Researchers are looking at this information themselves. I have an account on family search. I went and I looked at it. 
personally. Anne Bonny is there, 1733. Her name given wasn't spelled with an E. Um, it's not spelled anywhere um, except on the front page of the trials pamphlet. Inside the trials transcript, Anne Bonny's name is not spelled with an E. And we think that that popularized spelling came from the 1724 publication of the general history of pirates. So somebody, Captain Charles Johnson, whoever he was, added an E to the end of her name as well. Um, in a deference to attempting here to separate fact from fiction, this is why I have chosen to omit the E from her name today. So here they are. If it's generally understood that while the information in a general history of pirates from 1720 to 1724 is true, most of it is either completely fabricated or at least heavily embellished. We don't know the names of either of these women's parents. Talking about a William Cormack, father of Anne Bonny, that was added in the 1725 edition. And there have been searches into the records in South Carolina. The only land grant to a William Cormick with a different spelling, which is pretty typical in the 18th century, doesn't show up in the South Carolina records until 1735, long after, not too long after Anne Bonny is probably dead, but certainly it's not her son, if he could have survived, he would have only been maybe 14 years old. Um, nobody, no king is granting land to a 14 year old illegitimate child of a pirate. And it's certainly not her father, um, or if it is, she's not living there too. So the myth and legend that surrounds Anne Bonny growing up on a plantation outside of Charleston just doesn't exist in the records. William Cormick doesn't exist in the records. His name was added. It's the same with details about Mary Reed's life. Um, it is possible that she spent some time um, growing up as a boy or part of the army or navy. That could have been where she learned her fighting skills. It's not unheard of for women to dress in drag and go into the military. We see other examples of it throughout history, right up to and including our very own American Revolution. So that's not impossible. I just think that things like names, places, regiments, um, these very specific details are fabricated or embellished to build up her story. So why? Why are we doing this? They, why do we insist on a detailed backstory for these women to be icons? Is it not enough that they exercised their own agency, willingly took on the roles of pirates, sailed with Jack Rackham for at least a couple of years and then met their fate. I guess I just feel like that should be enough to show us empowerment and to make them icons. Why do I need the details of names of parents or lovers or husbands who never existed? Icons they became, um, though it can be argued whether famously or infamously and why do reputable historians continue to tell these stories like they're fact? There are a lot of pirate historians who are far more versed in this subject than myself, who point to the general history of pirates from 1724 as a factual document. And it just, it just isn't, it's propaganda. And for that, I submit to you these two photos here, the, the photos, these drawings, the drawing on the left, of these women fully covered, loose baggy clothing. They don't really pay much attention to the features of their faces. This is from the 1724 edition. One year later, over here on the right, they are in open shirts. Their breasts are hanging out. They have these hats that are at a jaunty angle. They have much tighter pants. They are armed to the teeth. Um, it didn't take very long for artists and publishers to give the readers what they wanted. And that's to say, my friends, that sex sells and they knew it and they took advantage of it. 
Um, this, more than anything else, is evidence of this publication as a work of fiction and propaganda. And it's a really good one. It's really good. By golly, does it do the job. I mean, these fantastical tales, there's a reason why Robinson Crusoe was so popular at the time. Um, these are fantastical, swashbuckling adventure stories and made so much the better because these ones are being acted out by women, which is completely against all social norms and regulations. So this is a fantastic piece of work, this general history of the pirates. My problem with it is it's not a historical document. Not really, not completely. So the trial transcripts, um, by contrast, are historical documentary evidence. And they, um, oh good, we have a suggestion for who Charles Johnson was. Fantastic, we'll talk about that. That's a guy I've never heard of. Um, the trial transcript makes no suggestion anywhere that Bonnie and Reed sailed around the Caribbean with their shirts open and their breasts exposed. Um, not just all the time, but never, not ever. They were either dressed as men or they were dressed as women. Um, and the outfits that they're wearing on the right aren't even outfits that men would have worn. I know, trust me, I have the colonial clothes. I know that those shirt collars are cut deep, but it wasn't this. Um, I really think that this is just um, sensationalism. That was really effective, beautiful, effective sensationalism. Um, the closest we come to understanding how their genders were discovered was the female victim who said that she only knew that these two were women during, her, uh, during their attack on her canoe by the largeness of her breasts. They, by the largeness of their breasts. She doesn't say, oh, they were half naked. She says, well, I could see that they had female features from my canoe. Um, and the impracticality of such a thing as dressing like this aside, the change in the artwork, like I said, signals further that this book was written more for entertainment than for recounting faithful history. Whether it was the scandal of brazen women bucking the dictates of their gender and station, whether it was a potentially, um, potentially a queer love story between the two of these women, which is another theory that's been posited and which is just as possible as not. It is equally plausible that they were lovers as not. Um, there's just, it, it, there's some reference to it written in the general history and again, was that written because it was historical fact or because it was something sensational that people could grip onto and not read about in their normal daily lives? Um, or, you know, no matter how we want all of this to be true, um, it, I just can't in good conscience after having researched this over and over and over again, say that that, that is a faithful historical account. But, it could certainly be all of these things. There's a little bit of truth. There's a lot of sensationalism. There's some embellishment. There is entertainment value. There is female empowerment. It is all of these things. And I think that's why Mary Reed and Anne Bonny and their stories resonate so much today because they happen to be the most famous example of women exacting their agency of women making decisions and making choices and taking chances in a world that wasn't meant for them to do that. Um, and it's ironic that the artist chooses in this particular example to expose these women in their femininity in a wholly misogynistic way because they were courageous and cruel and fierce and just as piratey as all the men who are worth mentioning. And it has nothing to do with whether they were running around with their shirts open or not. It has everything to do with how they behaved. And they behaved equally to the men that they were spending their time with, according to all witnesses.
Okay. I have harped on Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed enough, and I can't stress enough how much I love their stories. Um, heck, I portray Mary Reed <laughs> on a fairly regular basis. She is incredibly interesting, and she was a real person, and she really did a lot of interesting and terrible and outside the law things. So certainly a historical personage worth talking about still and examining. Um, I would just love to see more uh, historical research. So off we go into the brave new world. Throughout history, we seem to see two kinds of women who run off to sea to become pirates, the rich and repressed who yearn for self-determination in a world full of rigid structure, prescribed roles and social norms. Um, and the poor penniless girl who couldn't escape poverty except through prostitution or dressing as a man and enlisting in the military or running off in search of piracy, or maybe both if you're Mary Reed. So, so far we've mostly considered those rich women who are looking for perhaps self-determination, yearning for adventure, trying to break out of a mold. Um, but when we come over here to the women of European descent in America, and we are now in sort of the late 17th and then the late 18th centuries, I'm sorry, the 18th and early 19th centuries, um, we start to see some of women uh, in America cast from the same mold, like the women on this timeline. So these are all women who acted out their piratical careers along the East Coast of America. Shortly after the deaths of Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, there was a woman named Martha Farley, or maybe Mary Farley, or Mary Harvey, or Mary Farley with a different spelling. Um, and she was tried for piracy in Virginia. She was with three men when she was arrested and they were tried and convicted, but Martha was freed. She was acquitted. The court determined that even though she was there at the time of the piratical act in question, she had not actively participated in any fighting, raiding or um, piratical or felonious activity of any kind. Um, so she, the most that she did was apparently be on the merchant ship when this happened and then she eavesdropped on the crew that was captive in the hold to see if they were planning anything like an escape. So she got let go. Uh, the rest of these ladies not so lucky. Mary Critchett was already a convicted felon when she was transported to the colony of Virginia as punishment for her crimes. In 1729, she and some other male convicts escaped. They didn't want to be in jail in Virginia or anywhere else. Um, and so they captured a ship in the Rappahannock River in Virginia, and they had a short career pirating in the Chesapeake Bay, <laughs> my homeland, um, before they were caught. They were subsequently captured, tried, convicted, and all of them were executed. As a willing participant in these activities, Mary Critchett was not spared. She suffered the same fate as her male comrades, and that is why she is in the record books today, and we know her name as a pirate. Rachel Wall, moving past the American War for Independence. Rachel Wall was born in America, and we think that she was potentially the very first American female pirate. She was born Rachel Schmidt in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, but she married a fisherman named George Wall, and it was his scheming that turned the couple to piracy. They lived in Philadelphia and then New York, and then they moved to Boston, where they became active off the coast of New England in their stolen ship, the Essex. Their career saw the ambush of at least 12 ships. And uh, unfortunately, when their ship wrecked in a storm, everybody on the crew died except Rachel. She was the only survivor and her piracy came to an abrupt end, although her penchant for stealing and petty larceny did not. She ended up staying in Boston, no longer going to sea, but staying in the area she knew, the waterfront. She worked the ships and the crews at the docks in Boston. She was stealing, she was thieving, she was basically land pirating. Um, and she was eventually pinched for highway robbery. She was accused of assaulting a teenage girl and making off with her bonnet, her shoes, and her buckles. Ironically, Rachel maintained her innocence. She said, no, 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 I didn't do that. I didn't steal that girl's bonnet, shoes, and buckles. And when they asked her whether she did the pirating, she said, oh yeah, I did that. <laughs> but I didn't steal that girl's stuff. Um, she was in fact convicted and 
executed on Boston Common. She was hanged on Boston Common in October of 1789 for highway robbery. Barely 60 years later, moving into the 19th century, in New York City, there was a woman who terrorized the city. Her name was Sadie Farrell. She earned the nickname Sadie the Goat because of her particular fighting style. Apparently, she loved to go around headbutting people in the stomach to knock the wind out of them and um, do whatever mischief she was trying to do to them and assaulting them. Um, her success as the leader of the Charlton Street Gang saw her reach new heights. Sadie became a river pirate. She was the head of a small fleet of pirate ships that operated in the Hudson River and New York Harbor. They were successful for a short time, but they ended up reverting back to street theft. Um, and actually Sadie wasn't caught either, or if she was, we don't know about it. I can't find her in the record books. And um, so they're, they're street gang eventually disbanded and her fate beyond the 1860s and the close of the American Civil War is unknown. Um, but again, I stress that it's important to note that we only know about most of these women because they got caught. Um, the women like Saida Alhora, Zheng Yisao, Gran Yen Nima, uh, Waya, and Jeanne de Plisson, uh, Plisson were largely left undisturbed and allowed to retire peacefully but I wonder if that's not because of their social status, their great fortunes and their influence. They appear in the history books as leaders, rulers, politicians, and from a certain point of view, not at all, pirates. In contrast, those who sailed during the golden age of piracy and thereafter have been squarely relegated to criminal or villain or anti-hero status, thieves and murderers at the worst and dangerous women at the best. So, I think that it's that factor of danger in these women's lives and their experiences and the general sense of courage that with that danger, you know, they met that danger with courage. They chose their paths anyway. And that's something that continues to resonate with all of us. They are humans and they were the personification of courage, usually reserved for warrior heroes. And that finds itself a new home in the female anti-hero. These women either curved out, uh, carved out long-term positions of power and influence or short-lived but epic experiences of freedom, limited power, um, refusing to wear the yokes of gender, station, or expectation that were placed on them. Men throughout history have vilified such women for seizing their success through traits and behaviors considered to be masculine, like courage, like taking what's yours. And this upsets the natural order of things. Stepping outside of the woman's prescribed gender role, um, cultural nuances notwithstanding. Again, the European identification of cultural gender role is not worldwide. Um, today, I didn't even touch on gender identity, sexual orientation recorded throughout history. Um, these are completely separate lectures that all deserve their own examination as well. But whether women are sailing under the black flag or with government navies in disguise as men, it's truly a whole separate investigation. But suffice it to say that these legends are legends precisely because they resisted and rejected gender roles, socioeconomic norms, and in many cases, enshrined walls that may or may not have been just to those women in order to create the world that they wished to inhabit. Obviously, some were more successful than others in the end, depending on how you define and measure success. But I leave you to consider the question, who do we judge as having gained success? What does success look like to a woman? Liberty, independence, self-determination, self-appointed action, the capability to decide for courage or for self-preservation. And what does criminal activity look like when women seek revenge, when they seek justice outside of the law and freedom in a world that dictates that they should perhaps have none. So anyways, thank you for listening today. Just a quick note on these resources. These are just the published sources. I also consulted with some online sources, not Wikipedia folks. Go to Wikipedia's footnotes. That's where the good sources are. Um, if anyone's interested in a list of the articles and other um, online resources that I accessed, I can certainly provide those to Catherine. Um, 
And yeah, don't forget to come to Living History of the Powder Magazine on Saturday. Jack Rackham and I will be there and I'll be the most boring pirate you've ever seen because I will be dressed historically accurately. So um, I will not have my chest out there for the whole world to see. Um, and the whimsy that I indulge in is sea shanties. Most of them exist long after the 1720s, but I love to sing. I love sea shanties. So please come by for living history and we will indulge in some historically inaccurate, but very fun and wonderful sea shanty singing. The rule for sea shanties is quantity, not quality. So even if you think you can't sing, come out anyways. Um, and you can see my contact info there in the top right, um, my socials that you can follow and, and all of that. So um, yeah, I'll, is it okay if I leave this here for a hot second, Catherine? Yes, um, please. And I okay. just put in um, at living underscore her story um, for you in the chat. And um, I think that was just fascinating. I was absolutely amazed about, um, uh, was it Seek Young? Um, mm -hmm. with 60,000, yeah, I mean, 60,000 yeah. men is, is absolutely insane. Um, I guess it's really just Western bias, you know, that we've never heard of this woman. She didn't live that long ago, honestly. So, um, that's just absolutely amazing, um, to think about. So, is there any more, do you know, and I know we, um, you and I had talked a little bit about, and I think people in Charleston have been kind of following a little bit. I know it was in the news and the Post and Courier about the, um, that YouTuber who did the research on, on Ann Bonnie and her burial in Jamaica. Was there any other information that would sort of, sort of say what was going on between the trial and her death date? In 1733, or is it just a big, just a big it's mystery? It's a big question mark, um, and that would be something you know one would want to look for probate records, property records, um, anything that would link Anne Bonny to staying in Jamaica. Now, it is strongly likely that if Anne Bonny somehow managed to give birth in jail and get out of jail, and if she gave birth in jail, that could potentially be a reason for um, a court to, you know, change her sentence or, or just allow her to go free because now she's got a kid that would be a ward of the state otherwise, um, that she would just stay put. Her crew has all been executed. Jack Rackham, by all accounts, was her lover. He's gone. So it would make, it, it's kind of Occam's razor, right? The most likely explanation is the simplest. And what's most likely is that if she managed to make it out of that prison alive, which there aren't any records of her execution between 1720 and 1733, that she would just take the gift that fate handed her and stay on Jamaica and stop pirating and raise a kid and right. die 10 years later, 13 years later. You know, it, it's not everybody that, that escapes the news and to put an incredible spin on it um, is really defying historical logic. Definitely. So. Well, um, uh, test here is Dr. Linda Carnes McNaughton, who has some awesome. great info for you. Captain Charles Johnson was the pen name for Nathaniel Mist, a printer and journalist who lived in London, also a former sailor and who had access to trial records government documents and first sound accounts of retired pirates from primary sources. He created biographical sketches and published sequential copies of his general history of pirates book. And she says that there's sources for the compelling case of mist as Johnson come from a study by, um, I'm going to get this wrong. Um, yeah, Arnie, yeah, I can see it. I'm going to yeah. write that down so that I can check that out. You know, I don't, I'm glad to hear that there is a new potential um, known author for this, because again, that gives that clout back to it. Um, that gives that uh, veracity back to a lot of it. I'm still not convinced that the very specific details that are given in the general history stand, um, but these general biographical sketches, sure, that, that makes more sense. And I'm, I'm excited to see that that is um well 
as a segue, um, after Karen is going to be here, Karen and um, Andrew are going to be here on Saturday. Next Tuesday, um, Dr. Linda Corns McNaughton is going to be our speaker. She worked um, uh, on the crew that um, dealt with Blackbeard's ship, The Revenge, when it was excavated. Um, Linda really worked in the lab. Um, and so she has a background mostly in ceramics, but she dealt with all the material culture that was coming out of that um, uh, underwater archeology span of Blackbeard ship um, that was recovered off the coast of North Carolina. So I think that's gonna be a great talk. I know that there's ties between what happened here in Charleston with Blackbeard and the material that they recovered from the ship off the coast of North Carolina. So. I know you guys are all going to be really excited to hear that. I guess some questions, um, too, really about Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed. What were some of the outrageous things that Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed did? And do we know what happened to either one of their children or their, their child? Um, don't know. have to. Uh, so this is a big assumption, but I'm going to assume that if uh, Mary Reed died either in childbirth or shortly thereafter that her newborn child also didn't survive. Um, I cannot imagine a situation in which like the public would take care to get a wet nurse for a newborn child, illegitimate child of a pirate. Um, so I, uh, I don't know about Anne Bonnie's kid. I don't know if that child survived. Um, that is sort of one of the arguments for um, Anne Bonnie in Carolina. Um, but again, you know, and I, I think that the history field is moving more, more towards oral tradition as an effective and, um, valid historical record. Um, but I don't, I don't even know of any sort of valid oral traditions that suggest anything about their children. So, um, and frankly, folks, there was a lot of child mortality, um, what were some of the outrageous things they did? So you can read in the trials, the trial transcripts are pretty substantial. Um, Anne Bonnie was said to have acted as a powder monkey for the guns um, on the ship that they were on. They were both said to be fierce fighters. Of course, Mary Reed was known, um, if the general history can be believed on this score, she was known for her dueling capabilities. She was an excellent markswoman um, and she was good with a sword as well. So I am sure that fighting in hand-to-hand um, -hand combat was something that they both engaged in, albeit um, probably not all that much. I think the movies sometimes make us think that the heroes of the stories are so good that they can survive fight after fight after fight. Um, and so I, I can't imagine they engaged in too much hand-to-hand -hand combat, but some. And if the stories about Mary Reed can be believed, then, you know, she, um, picked a fight with a guy and challenged him to a duel before her lover, who was a worse shot, was supposed to duel with that same guy and she took him out. So she managed to win the duel before him, uh, before her lover would have to do it. And having served in the army, potentially in one of the navies, um, she certainly would have had the chops to move about ship and do the sailing. I don't know how much um, sailing knowledge anybody has, but when two tall wooden ships come into contact for a fight, it's not all hands to guns and swords. Somebody still has to sail the ship and somebody still has to steer the ship. Otherwise they have to, you know, they're either gonna crash into each other or move apart. So um, there still have to be um, assigned jobs, subscribed jobs for each person. And it sounds like from the trial transcripts that both Anne Bonny and Mary Reed were very capable of doing either thing in an assignment. They could either be hands to the sails to make sure that the ship doesn't crash or start feeding ammo to the gun crew. Um, a gun crew was generally six people, if not more, to fire one gun one time. So it took a lot. They would have needed a massive crew and they would have needed a lot of skilled sailors to do that in the din of war, in the fog of war. So lots of noise, lots of gunpowder, smoke. Um, they would really have to know their stuff in order to be effective sailors on a pirate ship. And 
you know, that doesn't all sound outrageous until you remember that these are pirate ships. They are engaging in criminal maritime activity. Even just setting your gun against someone in a threatening manner is a criminal act. So everything that they did was equal to everything that the men were doing, and that all counts as outrageous. Um, there is a legend that Anne Bonney said to John Rackham or said about John Rackham. Um, it is said that in their last fight, when they were captured, that all of the men of the crew went and hid below decks. And the only two that held the deck were Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed. Now, again, that's lovely. Now their ship is rudderless. It's going all sorts of crazy places. But it's said that Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed held the deck and that later, Anne, Bonnie said either to or about Jack Rackham, well, if you hadn't, um, if you had fought like a man, you wouldn't have had to hang like a dog. So I'm so glad you got that in there. That's it's the my favorite ever. thing about them. It is probably so not true. It's the most beautiful, again, sensationalist propaganda, the most beautiful kind. I but love what it. A, what a great quote. What a great quote. I don't know if she ever said it. I don't care. What a lady, man. What right. a lady. So, um, but she's said to have said that. So if that's the kind of woman, there it is. If that's the kind of woman that she was, that they both were, then even the crimes that are not enumerated against it. But I mean, so it, even in that very first quote I read that they were accused of um, setting upon the ship, boarding it, entering the sloop, assaulting the captain, um, taking carrying away the sloop and its apparel and tackle. That means all of the things that sail the ship, tackle, block and tackle. We say tackle today, it's not, it's tackle. Block and tackle to sail the ship. So anything that wasn't nailed down, they were either taking or using. Um, and so they're thieves, they're probably murderers, they're at least assaulting people. Um, they're good sailors, they're marksmen, they're sword fighters. Um, they're all of it. General badass women. General badass women. Yeah. So um, we're getting a lot of thank yous and fabulous. And I did want to mention that um, Dr. Linda Carnes McNaughton, who's going to speak to us tomorrow, um, co-authored a book um, that we'll try and get in our gift shop too. Um, Blackbeard's Sunken Prize um, is out through UNC Press. And I think it's got a lot of really good info in it. Um, and Karen, I want to, I want to connect you guys. I think between the two of you, you've got a, an awful lot of great knowledge and I know we're I'm over. <laughs> yes, this is, I've learned so much this month already. It's unbelievable. Um, and wait, we got one more. Um, oh yeah. Very interesting. Thank you so much. And um, I guess we will see you guys on Saturday and, um, and or see you next Tuesday. And a big thanks to Karen for a really fabulous presentation and um, stay in touch with us. We've got some more Pirate Month to go, but we'll, we'll get to it. And um, um, now don't run out and, and rob a ship or anything. We're not trying to promote this. Don't go but, um, <laughs> but at any rate, cover up. So. Um, Great job, Sue. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Thanks thank so you so much. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.